There's never been a weather event like that before that completely knocked out the, the whole area. It was two or three weeks before things really got back to normal. As a meteorologist, you get used to what is a typical situation and what isn't. And um, that just didn't feel right. There was something about it. You're stuck in, in the middle of nowhere and there's nowhere to run to. You can't run anywhere, you can't get, get off. So obviously the, the panic rises. Um, and then to be told that that was too windy for the choppers to fly, that didn't go down too well either. The mess, the damage, it, it was heartbreaking. The 15th and 16th of October 1987 brought a storm so powerful it left a trail of destruction, the worst in living memory. In the early hours of that morning, East Anglia was one of the places to take that hit. Winds over 90 miles an hour left buildings destroyed, phone and power lines down and thousands of trees ripped from the ground. All indelible memories for everyone who was there. Paul Geeter was working as a reporter that day in Ipswich. I had a phone call at six o'clock in the morning from my news editor who said, um, I need you to come into work. You're the first person I've actually managed to get hold of. It was very difficult to get really information about what was, at, what was happening out there. And it was very much pot luck who you could speak to, where you could get through to somebody. And to some extent, you were dealing on rumour, conjecture, um, and literally going out and seeing what you could find. There was a story in every village and on every street corner as the storm unexpectedly moved off the channel and across our part of the country. But with communication lines down, reporting itself became a dangerous job. I was told, oh, go and have a look round there. It's, it looks really spectacular down there. And there was, it had also brought down some high voltage overhead wires. And I was told, oh, don't worry about those. The electricity board has switched them off hours ago. There's no worry. And I was about to move one of these wires to go past. And at that moment, one last leaf came down, hit it and just went Pfft. And I don't know whether it was 25,000 volts or even more, but it wouldn't have been fun if I'd have touched that. In total, 18 people were killed across the UK that night. One was Sydney Riches, a West Norfolk farmer. That was after a car crash involving a lorry near to King's Lynn, where part of the road was blocked by a fallen tree. Famously, no one expected the storm to be so big. Forecasters Jim Bacon and Phil Garner now work for WeatherQuest at the University of East Anglia. At the time, Jim worked for Anglia TV, Philip for the Met Office. And as the storm approached, they knew from the reports that something wasn't right. Something strange was, was happening. Some of the observations from these ships down in the southwest uh, were starting to uh, be faulted. And it was related to the pressure falls. We couldn't quite work out why. The, the system was throwing out these messages, and when we looked at them closely, it because because the pressure was falling so quickly. And more and more of these messages were coming up as we went through the afternoon. It was a wonderfully clear night, and you could see all the stars. It was windy, middle of October, and it felt as warm as toast. And that just felt wrong. As a meteorologist, you get used to what is a typical situation and what isn't. And um, that just didn't feel right. There was something about it. For a temperature of 17 degrees Celsius at one o'clock in the morning, clear skies in the middle of October. The roof of Ipswich bus depot was blown off. Lorries blown over like on the Orwell Bridge and on the Yackel Strait. Caravan parks and tourist attractions along our coastlines were damaged and a prison ship at Harwich Harbour broke from its moorings and was left drifting in the storm. But 45 miles out into the North Sea, off the east coast was John Cullum, working on a live gas drilling rig and with a potential catastrophe heading their way. We got informed that we possibly had to evacuate because there was a semi-submersible rig which had broke this moorings and they don't have power as such. And that was on course, collision course, with us. They said they were going to scramble the helicopters, but then they said that was too windy for the choppers to fly. And after a few hours, I think the wind abated enough for the helicopters to fly 
Um, so we all had to don abandonment suits, crawl across the heli deck on the net, hands and knees, uh, while the chopper was sitting on the heli deck with the route was running, and that was still so windy that the helicopter was going up and down in the wind. They were flown to safety at a neighbouring platform and saw the drifting vessel pass just a few hundred metres from their rig. A close call that could have been so much worse. The rig I was on was live, I mean that was drilling, so you were down, you know, in the gas field, so anything could have happened. It's just a panic situation and we're all doing as we're told because we're told and that's, uh, you know, it's the right thing to do and you think that's the best thing to do. You know, the option wasn't to stay behind, the option was to get off if you could. Back on land, the damage was huge. The Sandlings Forest, made up of Rendlesham, Tunstall and Dunwich, lost somewhere between half a million and a million trees. It was one of the worst hit areas in the whole of the country. In the immaculate gardens of Blickling Hall in Norfolk, the gardening team were left with a huge clear-up job that took years to complete. In total, 265 trees were lost. We looked around, it was heartbreaking to see all this mess and the trees were lying down flat on the ground like a show jumping at Hickstead. All the jumps <laughs> were there, trees were hung up, branches were hung up and it, it was just a, a, a mess and we just didn't know really where to start. And it took a full two years before we actually cleared everything up ready to reseed. Historic trees were blown down and years of painstaking work and care blown away in just a matter of minutes. But it took years to return the gardens to their former glory. It was five or six years and because of, as I say, the little microclimate we got, the trees had shot up fairly well and today, 30 years on, you can see some of the trees are 50, 60 feet and um, a lot of people in the early days said, well, did you get any damage because we had cleared up so well. After the storm, BT had to deal with 35,000 faults across our region. Eastern Electricity had to restore power to a quarter of a million homes and the repair bill came to more than six million. Forecasting techniques have considerably improved and are more advanced and accurate now. But could an 87 ever happen again. We're definitely better resourced to see them developing and happening and I think that can give people a, a greater heads up should it happen again. We can give people warning through so many more media than just radio and television which is what it used to be uh, in the 1980s. It'll be happening this week, it'll be happening next week somewhere in the Atlantic and it's just the luck or otherwise that the storm track takes the strongest winds over a populated area. And uh, in the case of October 87, it was an unusually severe storm over a part of the country that doesn't normally get. It may now be 30 years since the great storm of 1987. If you weren't there, the pictures look like something out of a disaster movie. But if you were, it's an event that won't be forgotten.